Hello everyone, Attack Power here. Today I have for you how not to suck building decks in Steel Division 2. Let's dive right in. This is back to our original tutorial series, how not to suck. Time to get this video remastered and some great advice out to you guys to get you finally building decks in Steel Division 2 successfully so that you can win. This is the first step on the road to success. A lot of people lose simply because their deck is misbuilt and that they have no chance from the get go because they never really built the deck in the first place. If you like that kind of information, make sure to smash that like button. If you want a lot more Steel Division 2 fun, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you love this channel, check out that Patreon down below for even more cool perks like coaching, Discord access and other cool stuff. Let's do this. The first step in building your deck is picking your division seems obvious, but it's one of those things that really is going to define the way you build your deck. Of course, we have the allies, we have the axes. When you go into your build thing, of course, you're going to battle groups here, and you'll, these are the ones I've already built, of course, so all these here will be all the decks you've already built. And then if you want to create a fresh one, you click create. Really quick down here, just some things to note. When you click on one, you don't have to click edit, you can just double click the deck. Uh, rename is, is exactly what it sounds like. Delete, copy export so like if you want to share your deck with somebody else you click export and then when you press paste in say discord it will have that big long line of weird letters and symbols that's your deck code if you want to import so you see a deck code and you want it in your game you go down to this import you click import and then you'll see the code right there easy peasy lemon squeezy hopping down here though we're going to click create and we get our whole list of divisions now if you're an sd2 fanatic like me you buy it all and you want it all and you have it all here obviously if you do not buy all the dlcs you will not have the 80 plus divisions you see here it gives a ton of variety it makes this game why it's so great because there's just so much variety and every game is completely different which makes it so much fun but we're going to build here with a division that is in the original game so we're going to hop over here you can click these to like flip around the way it is organized we're going to go here with 20th panzer now every division has its own strengths and weaknesses they have this rating thing the rating thing's kind of a bunch of crap a is supposed to be really aggressive b is supposed to be balanced c is supposed to be defensive that's that's crap you can play any division kind of any way you want that there's really i mean sometimes these are sort of right but they're never Never really really right so don't think like oh if i build an a division i have to like be attacking all the time no nah, that's a bunch of crap if you build a c division you don't have to be defensive that's 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 crap but you know which division you do pick don't do matter so like panzer divisions tank divisions will have less infantry in them generally and more tanks in them naturally infantry divisions the opposite problem mechanized divisions will have things like half tracks and things like that in them you know special divisions like Fallschirmjägers or Sieglings or 78 Sturm you know things like these will have unique infantry in them unique units in them different factions of things here you know you get into your different factions Romanians and Finnish and Italian and you know on the, over here you get the Americans and Yugoslavians and French and British so you know there's all kinds of things to pick and I encourage you to just experiment with different divisions each one will have completely different strengths and weaknesses there's really no consistency across the divisions of like they all have this or that there's a couple units that you find in every single division and we'll mention those but you know for the most part each one is pretty darn unique we're going to hop in here, 20 pan, we double click and we get into our building page here. So you can rename your battle group up here, of course. And the, but the first thing we're really going to look up is the deployment type. This is your income available to you for the game. So if you don't know, the battle is broken up into three phases. We have phase A, which is the first 10 minutes, phase B, which is the next 10 minutes, and phase C, which is the remainder of the game. Remember, in a one on one, and we are talking here 1v1, generally speaking, but the same concepts apply to 10v10 and 2v2. You just have to build your deck slightly differently because those battles work differently. Each one of these demonstrates what kind of income you'll get in each phase. So for balance, you'll get 110 points per minute in the first 10 minutes, 130 in B phase for the next 10 minutes for every minute, you'll get 130 points. And finally in C phase for the remainder of the game, you'll get 155 points every tick or every minute. So when we say tick, we're talking about every minute. All right, and you can see the different types here. There are six in total. Balanced being one of the uh, slower income going for, don't be fooled by the name. It's really just a longer game income. You're expecting to get all your points mostly in C and survive until then. Vanguard is your attack early A phase here, and you can see it trickles off, so you don't have very much in C. Maverick is similar to Vanguard, but your big point bonus here is in B instead of in A. So a little slower to get started, but then you get a ton of points here, and it's really low in C. Juggernaut's even slower than balanced. You have Flatline, which does not change all the way across the board. And you have V for Victory, which is big in A, tiny in B, and then big again in C. So it's all kinds of different ways to build your deck. And the income you choose is going to significantly affect 
how you build your division. If you're building a Vanguard deck, so you're planning to attack early and everything, you shouldn't be putting in a lot of C-Phase cards because you don't have that many points to, to buy things with. So it doesn't make sense to have tons and tons of C-Phase cards. On the flip side, if you're a balanced deck, it doesn't make sense to go over overboard on A-Phase cards because you don't have that many points to deploy them. Now, one thing to remember though, is you need to survive A and B phase to get to C phase. A lot of players do not put enough units in A and B phase to survive until C phase. They just build tons of cards of C and they think, all right, cool, this is great. But that's not the way to do it. You're going to lose before you ever get access to all of those troops in C phase. So you do need to have a lot of troops in A, a lot of troops in B, and some troops in C. Coming down here, we have activation slots. So basically, for each slot you fill up, it takes up this many points of your activation points. In almost every division, the activation points is 50. There's one exception in Rukma Rapana, which has 55, but every other division in the game has 50 activation points. Once you've spent all these, you cannot put any more units in your deck. It's quite simple. Generally speaking, you notice that all the points at the beginning of the bar are generally cheaper. At the beginning of the tab, we call these tabs. Uh, you know, they're generally cheaper and they get more expensive you put more guys in so if you want this last slot of infantry it's going to cost you four activation points which is quite a lot and every deck is completely different in your infantry divisions you'll tend to have bigger infantry tabs and smaller tank tabs you may have large air forces smaller air force just to note the defense is you don't have to put these in they're always zero points this is just for the specific game type called breakthrough so if you're never going to play that you don't need to put defenses into your deck so that's how activation points work you do not need to use all of them you might have 49 out of 50 you definitely want to use as many as possible but sometimes the math doesn't work out and you have this unfortunate 49 out of 50 and the game every time you try to quit the game's gonna ask you are you sure you don't want to spend more points yeah you can't okay so that's how that works now let's hop in here to our infantry tab and we have all bunches of choices over here on the left which are all our different infantry types okay so if we zoom in here to a unit Let's take the pantogram, we click on it, and it brings up its information panel over here, of course. On the panel here, there's some key points of information. This top left number here in the yellow is how many points the unit is worth, how many points you have to spend to bring it into the map. Underneath that is a blue number that represents the number of these guys you can call in in this deployment. So in other words, if you put this dude in A, you can see what phase I'm bringing him in here. I will get nine of them, and I can spend 30 points to bring in one at a time and I have nine of them until they're all gone. Over here is how I change how many I bring in and when I bring them in. So we talked about the phases here. You can see deployment phase and experience. So first we're going to talk about the deployment phase. When you bring in troops later, you'll notice the number is rising. So when I bring in troops later in the game, I get more availability in order to call more troops in. This is huge. This is the balancing act of building in Div Steel Division 2, and this is what makes it so fun. You're always trying to balance numbers with quality. The earlier you call troops in, the less of them you're going to get. The thing is, though, you need to survive A phase and necessarily B phase, depending on how your deck is built, or perhaps you're attacking heavily in A phase, and that's going to make mean you're going to need more A phase cards than B phase and more B phase than C phase, because you get so many troops on one card in C phase, you don't need four cards of C phase infantry because that's just ridiculous you need probably three to four cards of a phase infantry because their numbers are so low so this is what you need to be aware of when building your decks in steel division 2 that you need plenty of early game stuff to survive to the late game don't just pile them all into c phase i'll show you some decks later here where you'll see how few cards i have in c phase generally because one or two cards goes a long way i don't need a lot but i do need more at the beginning in order to have the flexibility to respond to problems and make pushes my Myself. Now, underneath deployment phase, we have experience. Now, this is veterancy. We also just call it veterancy. Veterancy is a key part of Steel Division 2. The higher a veterancy of a unit, the more damage, output, fire, fire rate, suppression resistance, accuracy that unit will have. You can see when I click into one vet here, you can see down here the numbers reflect an increase in their values. So the accuracy has gone up, the rate of fire has gone up. There are other values you cannot see on the card. Your units technically move faster, they get suppressed more slowly and recover from suppression more quickly. So veterancy does a whole lot of things you definitely want. The most important things, of course, fire rate and accuracy are the ones you really, really want. But suppression resistance is pretty huge too. It allows your troops to fight longer without getting suppressed and forcing them 
to surrender or fall back. Now, one thing I do want to make sure I point out here, if you look, when I go to one vet, I lose availability. My Bandagrans go from nine availability to six. And if I double vet them, they go all the way down to three. And this is where the balancing comes in. I want my Panzergrens to have as much veterancy as possible because they are more effective and efficient that way. The problem is if I bring them in at higher veterancies, I'm going to have far less of them. Once again, even con constraining my infantry numbers even more. For some divisions, this is okay. You have a lot of slots in a certain tab and you don't mind having less cards because or less units because the units you're bringing in are really powerful or you have lots of slots available so it's not a big deal if you get less per card but other divisions have very low numbers of activation points or activation tabs here in their tab and therefore they can't bring infantry or they can't bring any unit in at higher veterancies because they don't have that much availability so this is what you have to balance in steel division two now default Assume one vet is usually the best thing to go with. Uh, it's an, it strikes a nice balance between availability and efficiency, giving your troops one vet. Now, this again is very dependent on the division. If you have a division with really small tabs of a certain type, you may not want to vet those units at all, especially we're talking in the infantry tab. But if you have a really a lot of slots in, in the infantry tab or any tab for that matter, you may want to vet them up because you can still get plenty of them and they're going to be more effective at the higher veterancy. So this is really key. Remembering that veterancy really matters. For infantry and all types of support weapons and stuff, we also have the transport. It's very important that you pick good transport. Some transports are bad and some are just straight better. For example, the Opel Blitz is your Axis like standard transport here at 80 kilometers an hour. This is the number that matters. For transports, this is what you care about. How fast do they move? 80 kilometers is a nice speed. So the fastest transports in the game go about 100, but those only carry small units. 90 is, once again, only smaller units. 80 is your, like, fastest big transport that can carry infantry squads like this so 80 is good 70 is okay 60 is kind of bad anything slower than that is really slow so you'll notice here i have other options like the sdk of z10 is only 65 kilometers an hour i don't want to bring my troops into this with this because they're going to move slowly and get to the battlefield more slowly that sucks so always check and you have like really slow option here this one's only 53 uh you can also some transports have weapons Okay, this has an MG42, this half track, but it is slower and it costs five points. So you'll notice the cost of the card is now 35 points because now when I call this in, it's going to come in with a half track and an infantry squad. Usually speaking, when you call in these zero point transports, once they've dropped off their unit, they disappear. When you call in transports that have a cost, they are going to stick around and you can use them for whatever you intend to use them for, being that transporting troops around more or using them for fighting. So always check, you can also hit display all transports and it's going to show you all the different transports here that you have to choose from. Be careful, there is an availability limit on the transport. So if you run out of Opal Blitzes, you're going to have to move down to the KFZ, which only has 70 kilometers an hour. It's slower than the Opal Blitz. So it's a downgrade to be sure. But that's just what it is in a lot of different divisions. Okay. I'm Continuing on here, we have the information tab here. It tells you all sorts of important information from the weapon loadouts. It tells you all kinds of cool information. Damage is, of course, how much damage they do. Suppression is how much suppression is applied every time they fire. Blast is how much area. Like So, like, if they miss, will they still apply, like, suppression to the opponent? Accuracy is accuracy. Range is your range, of course. And rate of fire is how fast the gun shoots. Now, do understand, it doesn't actually fire 192 rounds a minute. It's fires them in bursts, and it just means it's going to reload and fire bursts more quickly than if it had a slower firing speed. Of course, then you have the strength of the squad, which is 10 men, so it's saying there are 10 men in the squad. Optics is how well they see, stealth is how well they hide, and cargo space is what kind of transports they have to be brought in, heavy being, you know, a 10-man squad has to come in those kind of transports. Over here, we have all kinds of different traits on our units as well. If we look here, we can see that this has the disheartened trait, and if you just mouse over the trait, you can see what it does. I'm not going to go through every single trait here. I'm just going to explain that. Make sure you check for the different kinds of traits. See, this is a flamer. It's telling you that it has some sort of flame carrying weapon here that it can use in combat. Another type of unit we need to make sure we are aware of is the leader. Anytime you see the star here, what the leader does, and this is really important, a leader increases the veterancy rating of the units around it by one rank. So if there is a leader next to this Panzergren here, and this Panzergren has no veterancy, when the leader is next to him, it will now have one veterancy. Once it leaves the leader's range, it will go back down to zero veterancy, okay? So if my base veterancy is one, it'll go to two. If my base veterancy is two, it'll go to three. Notice you cannot bring troops in 
at three veterancy. Two is the absolute maximum that you can bring a troop in. You then need a leader to get it to three veterancy. There is no four veterancy. Three is the maximum. So this is really important. You want to bring leaders. Leaders are very important. They make your troops more efficient without you having to spend more slots on like, you know, have lower availability. So it allows you to have high availability with veterancy on your troops. So learning to use leaders is really important. Do not put leaders in the front lines. And like I said, I'm gonna go over like basics of building here in a little bit. I just wanna make sure all the units are covered. Of course, we have these different tabs here. I should have mentioned this earlier with recon, infantry, tanks, support, anti-tank, anti-air, artillery, and air. Recon is of course for spotting things. Infantry are your infantry. You want lots of these, you need infantry. Tanks are your tanks, okay? Support is generally things that do HE damage. In other words, high explosive or killing infantry or soft targets are found in the support tab. Also, you have things like supply. Okay, so we hop in here. Supply, munitions, trucks, these guys can reload your infantry, uh, reload all your units, but they do not restore health. Let me be very clear about this. Munition trucks do not restore the health of your units. All they do is reload the ammo on your unit. So be aware, once your units in this game are damaged, they're damaged forever. There's no getting troops back once they are hurt or damaged. Also, we have a commandant here, or the, the commander. The commander has this three-star little yellow symbol here. Now, what a commander does, the commander increases all units' veterancy around them by two instead of one. On top of that, any leader in range of the commander will also buff the troops around them by two instead of one. So any leader that's in range of the commander, and there's a 1500 meter range, so you know if they're within 1500 meters of the commander, they will now pump the, in, the units around them by two vet instead of just one. So this is a very powerful unit, but it is expensive and you generally only get one per card. So you have to be very careful with them and you do not want these on the front lines, but they can make all your units very, very strong and vetted because of their two veteran C ability. So something to always consider bringing into your division. Finally, in terms of building, you want to make sure that you build balanced decks, and I don't mean balanced in income, but I mean balanced as in you have stuff in almost every tab because this gives you flexibility and allows you to respond to different situations in the game. If you only have it, if you have like no AA at all, then you have no way to kill planes. If you have no AT at all, then you don't really have very efficient ways to kill tanks. If you have no tanks, you're going to have a hard time pushing into open areas. Now, some divisions have limitations. They simply don't have many tanks, or they simply don't have many AA or infantry or whatever it happens to be. This is part of building the deck. Every division has its strengths and its weaknesses. Let's dive in quick here to this 20th Panzer Division I have built. I have decided to build it on balanced. If I wanted to build it Maverick, I can. It's not that I can't. Some divisions, though, work better in certain incomes because of limitations in availability and veterancy. So it's just something to be aware of. When I dive in here, you can see that I have some recon, a whole bunch of infantry, tanks, support, AT, a whole bunch of AA, some artillery, and then some air force as well. This allows me to respond to any sort of situation. Now, let me show you here. If you go up here, you can see filter by phase. If I turn off the B and the C phase, we can see how many units cards I have here in A. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 A phase cards. If we go to B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we have seven less cards of B phase units than I do of A. And if we go go to C, I only have three C phase cards. And this is in a balanced deck. Like I'm planning for the game to go a long time and for me to spend a lot of time in C phase. I'm still only bringing three cards of C phase units. This is because you need more units at the beginning of the game to survive because of their lower availability than you need at the end of the game because these cards come with a lot of units on them. So you need very few to fill up your C phase. So when building your deck, you want to keep this in mind. And this is even more so if you're picking aggressive income, such as Vanguard and Maverick, you're going to want to have even more troops at the beginning of the game and less troops at the end because you have less points to be able to call troops in as the game goes on. So you want more more troops at the beginning because the worst thing you want the worst thing that can happen is you are two minutes left of a phase and you have no infantry left or you have no of a none of a unit you desperately need in in that phase so that's a huge deal that you make sure you bring in enough units that you can fill out the different phases and have answers to as much things as you possibly can whenever a division allows for it you want variety you want different things you want all kinds of different units to be able to respond to the different kinds of situations that you're going to find yourself in 
in Steel Division 2. I hope this was helpful and I hope this is going to help you suck a little less at building your decks in Steel Division 2. Don't be afraid to copy deck codes out of discords and things like that. If you are not part of the SDL discord, make sure to go check that out. There's all kinds of tournaments and things there. There's also an SD2 bootcamp where they have deck codes and everything for every single division in the game that you can use to get yourself started. You can also check out Hobo Tango's Kingdom discord, which has all kinds of helpful hints and everything and people coaching and things that you can get better at Steel Division 2 there as well. These are great places to find deck lists. You can also check out my series on how to play the divisions. I've gone through a good 50 or 60 of them and you can get deck codes from those videos as well so that you can try those divisions out without having to actually build the decks yourself. Never say autofill. Autofill is terrible. <laughs> I should note here right at the end of this autofill is bad. Don't do it. Do it, build them yourself or find a good player who can give you a deck code so that you can be successful. You don't want to walk into a game with a bad deck build because right off the bat, you're on the back foot and you're going to lose simply because your deck is misbuilt and you're going to be screwed because of that. If you guys enjoyed this, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe and consider supporting over on Patreon. Thanks a bunch, guys, and have a fantastic day.